All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin uh, this next session here. Uh, by means of introduction, my name is Nicholas Gafuick. Uh, I worked for many years at the Manning Centre and uh, now I work in the energy sector and I have the privilege of uh, chairing this final session on the topic of green conservatism or outdoor conservatives and environmental policy. Uh, I think it's true to say that in economic concerns, jobs, the economy dominate, but I don't think that that's necessarily always going to be the case. And I do think that the environment will be an important issue in the near to medium term, whether that takes the form of debates about energy and the environment, human health, air quality, water quality, and these kinds of issues. Indeed, our relationship with our natural environment and the resources our territory provides is an important issue, uh, pardon me, is an important part of how we define ourselves as Canadians. There's also the tactical side of the equation here. We're talking about growing the conservative movement and uh, you'll note in some of the work around the Manning Center barometer and some of that demographic analysis, one of the potential near customers identified are those called urban greens. So then, the question is, do we as conservatives have something to say about all of this, something to say about the environment? If so, what? And if we have something to say, then what the heck are we gonna do about it? This then is the topic for our panel today. So we have four panelists who are going to uh, try to address a series of questions related to this central thesis. First of all, uh, Bob Sopak, a Manitoba MP, a biologist, and uh, a real outdoor conservative, uh, is going to outline the principles of a conservative approach to the environment. And he's going to talk about how these are compatible with conservative values. Second, Michelle Rempel, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment, will talk about Canada's environmental record as a source of pride and distinguish between the myths and facts on the environmental front. Bob Mills, a former MP and current member of the National Roundtable on the Environment and Economy, will describe a conservative environmentalist in action himself and his activities in promoting conservation, solar panels on his house, garbage disposal and international promotional efforts. And then finally, Monty Solberg, former cabinet minister and uh, outdoorsman in his own right, will present where do we go from here, including suggestions for organizing outdoor Canadians in support of responsible environmental positions and policies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to our speakers. Each will speak for about 10 minutes, and uh, hopefully we'll conclude with some good discussion, questions, and answers. Thank you very much. Bob. Hi, hi there. What a pleasure it is for me to be here to talk about the principles of conservative environmentalism. Where do I, where do I poke them? Okay, there we go. And this is me in my more natural habitat. Uh, shortly after I got elected in a by-election, the Toronto Star did a column about me. And uh, they were reported on an interview I did with Charles Ad Adler a while ago. And uh, when I was talking to Chuck off the air, telling him about myself, I, he said, so you're kind of a right-wing environmentalist, aren't you, Bob? And I said, yeah, I guess I am. And of course, then he bellowed out on, on the air, welcome to Canada's right-wing environmentalist, Bob Sopak. And that was picked up by the Tor Toronto Star. And uh, being a good uh, conservative MP, I declined to be interviewed. And, uh, uh, but uh, Alan, Alan Ta oh, Wood, I think, Woods, uh, found a whole bunch of stuff on the internet and uh, that pi that's the picture he used in, in the Tr Toronto Star. That's uh, me at my uh, farm. My wife Caroline is here. We live on a, we live in a log house back back in the woods, and uh, that's more typical of uh, how how we uh, live. We live off the land whenever we we can, and we uh, eat wild game and grow our own food as best best we can. So what's wrong with most environmental policies, programs, and campaigns? And I said most, and one of the things is that I'm delighted to be, I'm on the Environment Committee, along with uh, the brilliant and talented Michelle Rempel, the Parliamentary Secretary for the Environment. I'm, I'm sucking up there because she's a very powerful person. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and uh, all I can say is what I'm seeing in, 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 in the Environment co Committee 
there is a real willingness on the behalf of this government, not only to fix environmental policy, but to tailor it along the lines of what it means to be a conservative. I'm delighted to see it. But this is kind of a scan from what I see across the country. Nobody does the math. Everybody has this feel-good thing. We want to do this stuff for the environment. And my question is, what are you actually doing? What do the numbers actually say? My main environmental concern is about the physics, chemistry, and biology of the environment itself. And that's what I look, look at. And I can, I've been accused of being somewhat cold and scientific, but I think there's so much wasteful spending in pro provinces across the country, and indeed at the federal government, because nobody seems to do the math in terms of the environment. Too much emphasis on energy conservation to the exclusion of everything else. It's too urban oriented. In my, my view, most of Canada is our beautiful landscapes of land and water and wildlife and soil. And so I want to see programs that deal with land, air and water quality, fish, wildlife, biodiversity, groundwater recharge. And I know there's a lot of talk about a carbon tax, but again, I'd ask the question of anybody that wants to institute a carbon tax or has instituted a carbon tax, and I'm not going to get into the issue of climate change, but it, you know, I, my question is, what do you get for the carbon tax? What have you done in terms of the math? I want to clean up lakes. Nature as a museum, as if drawing lines on maps and keep, keeping people out deals with all the environmental issues. Continued, there's too much command and control and not enough incentives. Again, the instinctive uh, push by left-wing environmental groups is more and more reg regulations and not enough emphasis on incentives. Failure to appreciate our ability to solve ecological pro problems. I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I'm actually a pretty happy war warrior, a la Hugh C Siegel. And again, I'm incredibly optimistic about not only the environment where it's at now, but our ability to deal with environmental issues as they arise or the environmental issues we've not yet dealt with. I'm going to show you in a minute how we've done, done that. Emphasis on process as opposed to environmental outcomes. M Michelle and I sat through a whole bunch of pu uh, public hearings on the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. One thing I found from the industry groups who were there, they talked about environmental outcomes, air quality, water quality, what their pro projects, uh, the potential impact the projects will have, what they intend to do about it, and so, so, so on. The left-wing environmental groups were all represented by law lawyers, and all they talked about was environmental pro process. That was it. As I said, I care about the physics, chemistry, and biology of the environment. That should be central to any conservative environmental policy. And often environmental policy right across the country inhibits rural and natural resource industries and communities. And Minister Oliver in an earlier se se session talked at length about that. Too much emphasis on green jobs, whatever they are, as opposed to what's called a non-green job. There must be a non-green job if there's a green job. In my world, every job should be a green job. The six principles for making policy smart, green, and conservative. These are soapbox principles. First one, rely on truly unbiased sci science. And again, um, I, I come from a science ba background. I'm a fisheries bi biologist. I've done environmental studies out there. And again, what I see and read, uh, scientists with agen agendas are, are, are to be shunned, but sci scientists who take a cold look at what actually is happening out there, a cold, hard, objective look at what's happening out, out there, those are the people we need to listen to. Focus on measurable results. It goes back to what, what I'm saying, do the math. And here's some me measurable results. I think a science guy, I do like uh, graphs. This is a graph of nitrogen dioxide in ma major ci cities trend over time since 1980, 1980. Look at that, going down. Measurable results, Sul sulfur dioxide in ca Canada, again, going down dramatically. And, and do you see where it went down, down the most? That decline in sulfur dioxide, which is the acid rain, started under a conservative PM, Brian Mul Mul uh, Mulroney. And again, this is a lake in my own area in Riding Mountain Na National Park, phosphorus reduction in 2008 when Jim Prentice was environment minister. He put a whole bunch of money into fixing up the uh, sewage si system in R Riding Mountain Na National Park because Clear Lake was, be was beginning to be less clear and lo and behold, look what happened. Phosphorus inputs into Clear Lake uh, went down dr dramatically and the lake is clearing up significantly. Celebrate wealth creation as the wellspring for environmental improvement. In one of the more saucy columns I uh, wrote, I entitled it, let's all get rich and save the environment. 
rich countries do a way better job of protecting the environment than poor countries do. And there's a reason for that, because we care. Here's, a, here's an, another graph uh, showing sulfur dioxide emissions from the U.S. And again, the uh, x-axis is multiples of 1990 affluence, which showed as the United States became twice as rich, four times as rich, eight times as rich, up to being four times as rich as they were in 1900, sulfur dioxide emissions went up. But as they became richer and ri richer, sulfur dioxide emissions went down. And again, these are the results that, happens in, that happen in rich countries where citizens care about the environment and they have the wealth to devote to fixing pro problems. Substitute risk and cost benefit analysis for their precautionary pr principle. The precautionary principle has been embedded in much legislation and again, we, the precautionary principle carried to a logical extreme means you wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't even cross, cross the street. Whereas we always, when we cross the street or get on an airplane, we do a risk analysis. And that's what environmental policy, policy should be based on. Focus on incentives via property rights, direct payments, and proper pr pricing while implementing smart regulations where necessary. And embrace environmentally friendly te technology. And again, the technology, uh, and again, the example of the oil sands that perhaps Michelle will talk, talk about, a recent announcement by the oil companies, there is some stunningly uh, wonderful environmental technology about to be implemented into, in the oil sands. I worked in the oil sands the winter of 2009, 2010. I did environmental uh, assessment in the oil sands. I lived in a camp north of Fort Mac, and again, it was a pretty impressive uh, site. It's pretty impressive the, the resources that the companies devote to environmental protection. So here's some parting thoughts on conservative political stra strategies and the environment. Again, how we play this particular game. For goodness sake, stop playing defense. Play on our own football field, not theirs. We're always reacting to them. <clears throat> stop reacting to them. Talk about what we're doing, and don't react. Be optimistic about our ability to solve environmental pro problems. And at the same time, pushing for continuous environmental improvement is a good thing, and we can get that. Advocate for the principle that a clean, green, and healthy environment is the birthright of advanced industrial societies, and the results bear them out. As a country becomes richer, people care more about the environment, more resources are devoted to, to, to the envir environment, the environment improves, the country gets richer, and it is just a very virtuous circle. Take the time to become knowledgeable about the principles of ecology. I'm astonished at environmental advocates these days. They know nothing about nature itself. My wife and I, Caroline, as I said, we garden, we hunt, we fish, we cut down trees, we do all of that stuff. And I think our knowledge of what actually goes on out there has certainly shaped our worldview, my world, world view. But if you're a computer environmental ad advocate, you don't know anything about what goes on out there. Vigorously defend the environmental track records of conservative governments. And I think Monty's going to talk about uh, that. But again, um, we, uh, we know who ca Canada's gre greenest P PM was. Assure Canadians that their jobs and incomes do not come at the expense of the envi environment. I'm nervous about this environment versus economy thing. I want to see both improve. Vigorously defend the sustainable use of natural resources. It's only the basis of our entire economy. Play to the natural, our natural conservation constituency, the sustainable use community. Farmers, hunters, anglers, wildlife associations, trappers, seal hunters, commercial fishermen, loggers, and miners. This goes back to the point I made about playing on our football field. These folks, they're our football team. Let's play to them. Reprioritize environmental spending and put money into programs that deal with real conservation pro priorities. Land, water, fish, forest, wi wildlife, and air qual quality. Focus like a laser on generating measurable and constant environmental improvement with real conservation outcomes. And again, I really like what the PM said. He said, conservative principles are can Canadian principles. But what I want to see ha happen, and regarding the environment, let's be proud to say that con conservative conservation pl principles reflect Canadians' conservation pr priorities. The last slide is uh, conservative style conservation in act action. And I'm surprising my wife Caroline with this pic picture there. 
The picture on the left uh, is a tree that Caroline and I cut early in our marriage on our, our farm. You see my left hand is on the stump that's slowly moldering away into the forest floor. And right beside it is a brand new tree that has grown beside that. And, and we have made a pact that before we shake off these mortal coils, we'll go back and cut that forest again to prove the point. And on the right hand side, you'll see that's my wife, Caroline. Uh, she's a very unique in, in individual. The kids and I bought her a log splitter for Mother's Day, and she actually liked it. <laughs> she actually liked it. And uh, so uh, for all you single guys out there, um, perfect woman, okay? Got that? <laughs> she's uh, blushing, and she's... <laughs> I'll, I'm going to catch it when, when we get back, get back to our apartment. But anyway, uh, again, uh, we as conservatives should not be in, afraid of the environment issue at all. Our track record is better than theirs, and let's ce celebrate it. And hopefully, Michelle and I, we're going to be able to implement it. Thank you very much. Caroline, I'm so jealous. <laughs> I totally want a log splitter. I can, it's going to be of great use in downtown Calgary. Note, note that. Um, I, I wanted to speak a little bit today about uh, my experience as a new MP and uh, my experience in the environment portfolio having that uh, appointment right off the bat, uh, given the context of my background. Um, I'm a, I, my educational background is in economics, but I, I've spent the most part of my career managing intellectual property. Uh, did some managerial consulting as well, but for the last five years, I worked at the University of Calgary managing their sponsored research portfolio. So that means uh, research that is done in partnership with industry, uh, as well as some of their intellectual property management. So um, looking at commercializing new technology, um, getting policy idea into, into legislation, out into practice. And uh, as an Albertan, uh, it, it was really fascinating to be part of um, that particular line of work because there was such a focus on clean energy technology and investment into um, environmental sustainability at the heart of, of industry growing. So when I was elected and I came out here, I was marginally shocked to um, experience the the level of politicize, uh, or politicization around this issue. And I find it, especially as a young, relatively young Canadian, um, unfortunate. Um, because this is an issue that I think is, is important to all Canadians. I don't think that there is one person in this room, uh, conservative or not, who would say that they do not care about the environment. It's something that links us together as Canadians, a respect for our natural heritage. And as I've traveled the country this year, uh, you know, talking to Canadians and listening to Canadians, people take pride in Canada's landscape. So, so with that, um, I, I wanted to do an exercise on separating myth from reality on this, um, because perception is reality. And as conservatives, uh, we can win on this file. Not only can we win on this file, we are winning on this file. So it becomes, changing it becomes about changing perception. So why is this so important? Um, success for conservatives in this file is really about separating fiction, separating the spin that we've, we've heard from the left on this issue uh, from reality. And the reality is, is that as conservatives, we approach environmental issues with pragmatism and with focus. Um, we also need good communication. So, you know, just going into that principle, uh, I, I really feel that we need to uh, move away from uh, approaching environmentalism as a dogma on both sides of the issue, on both sides of the debate, and replace that with pragmatism. And that's really what you've seen our government do. Our government's focus has been on pragmatism in policy. So, saying, how can we um, cap or acknowledge that fundamental Canadian value of the need to respect our natural heritage while balancing that with principles like economic sustainability and uh, you know, prudent use of taxpayer resources? And to my colleague, who is also one, I, I so enjoy working with you, Bob. We've got Stella Ambler here, too. Stella's on our environment committee. And uh, we have such a talented group of people that really care about this issue. So it's how do we, how do we um, really approach this as we would any other conservative issue? Um, 
the first point in that that I'd like to say is my experience is that first and foremost, we need to um, get acknowledgement from a broad uh, group of stakeholders that the environmental debate does uh, occur within the context of the economic debate as well. And it's okay to talk about that. The reality is in Canada, we are, uh, energy is our competitive advantage. We are a natural resource development based economy. And while there are numerous um, policies and incentives and desires to move um, and expand and grow and diversify our economy, we have over $500 billion worth of natural resource uh, developments that could occur over the next 25 years with the right policy regime. And that's something that can't be ignored given the global economic uh, context right now. The other thing is that uh, I've noticed is that there's a propensity to have environmental policy, the scope of that, creep greatly into industrial regulation policy. Because you can't talk about, on the floor of the House of Commons, wholesale regulating uh, the energy sector or shutting it down. Because that's, that's not going to fly with the uh, majority of Canadians. We've seen that over and over in our election campaigns, especially now with the way that the economy is. Um, so we've, we find that the left often contextualizes this debate by trying to expand the scope of environmental policy. And you know, Bob touched about, uh, on that a little bit briefly already in that our policy needs to be focused on outcomes. And, and that means measurable action where we see uh, good use, we can explain to taxpayers how we're using their resources, we can explain to industry why we're regulating, uh, because you can actually see an impact on the environment. And you know, this is the, my unicorns and rainbows uh, statement for the day, but this, this debate really is about winning hearts and minds. And it's something that we often don't talk about as conservatives on the environment is, you know, we, we get the fiscal reality. I, I would argue that everyone in this room understands the fiscal reality of the need to, to, to develop um, certain sectors that, that do have an impact on the environment. But there, the, the, the left has been very good at winning the hearts of people by showing ducks and this sorts of thing, uh, these sorts of things. So we have to, when we're talking about reality, also understand that fundamentally this is an emotional issue for people because of that Canadian value of respecting our natural heritage. And I'll move along quickly, I promise. So number one, myth number one. This is the first myth I, 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 I hear all the time. Canada is a laggard when it comes to environmental policy. This is patently false. I mean, I, I do not understand how any rational human being can actually put this out there. When you look at the uh, stringent environmental regulatory process that we have in this country, it's, it's one of our competitive advantages in obtaining social license. And the other thing is that our government, industry, all sorts of charitable stakeholder groups all invest into conserving our natural heritage. This is reality. And any time I hear uh, opposition colleagues try to, especially citizens of our country, not even you know, I, I, you know, NGOs that are located in other countries or other government, but members of our country say that we are not a leader, it, it just irritates me to the core because it is not reality. Um, the other thing is that our government actually has a very strong track record, and I think it could be argued the strongest track record uh, in, in, in protecting the environment from a measurable way while managing uh, taxpayer resources in an appropriate way and still ensuring economic growth. So some of the things that we've done since 2006, very briefly, we've introduced the chemical management plan. We've seen um, several thousands worth of uh, uh, harmful chemicals be evaluated in an arm's length scientific way and then uh, integrated into regulations that are, were developed in consultation with industry. Uh, we have a robust re uh, wastewater management regulatory framework. We've done a lot of work in the air quality management side of things. Uh, we've protected records amount of parklands and habit marine habitat. Uh, our outside of the environment portfolio and beyond, we've invested millions of dollars um, and, and provided a lot of support into research and development for clean technology. And um, you know, we've taken a pragmatic approach to managing greenhouse gas emissions. And you know, I think the decision that we took in, that we made in December to pull out of Kyoto, while we took a lot of heat of that on the international stage for that perception versus reality sort of reason, was a wise one because that agreement 
um, now, when it was ratified, only included 30% of um, major emitters. Now it includes less than 13%. This agreement does not include all binding, uh, or sorry, all major emitters. And if we're going to be part of an international agreement, we cannot competitive, A, we cannot competitively disadvantage our economy, but B, why would you only, why would you sign on to an agreement that only has 13% or whatever the figure is at this point in time of major, like major emitters? It just seems counterproductive. So the work that we've been undertaking in uh, Copenhagen, in Cancun, uh, in December, in Durban, was to move towards that agreement. And we are seeing progress on the international stage, which is very positive. Uh, we also have a strong sector-by-sector uh, -sector regulatory approach here in this country where we're, whereby we're working with industry to say how can we realistically implement uh, greenhouse gas emission targets, again, without disadvantaging our economy and seeing those real reductions. Uh, we've invested uh, cl into climate change adaptation, and I could spend my whole presentation on this topic, um, but uh, what I wanted to briefly do is contrast that with the previous Liberal government who, um, and I'll be partisan here, signed on to um, the Kyoto Protocol without a plan to implement it, and uh, also saw greenhouse gas emissions rise by almost 30% under their tenure. So it just marginally infuriates me to have to deal with this, percep this particular mis misperception that is always propagated uh, by the opposition. Number two, the economy must be sacrificed to achieve positive environmental outcomes. I've already spoke to this, so has, uh, so has Bob. This is, this, we can have our cake and eat it too in this. I, 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 I'm com in complete belief of this. It's okay for us as conservatives to say, we recognize what the drivers of our economy are. Now, how can we protect our environment in a strong policy framework that uh, encourages that? Uh, we don't need to shut down the oil sands. We don't need to regulate a sector so that it's no longer economically viable to operate. And we don't need to participate in agreements that punit uh, would, would require us to give punitive transfers to other countries for meeting targets that aren't reasonable. We have a balanced approach. Um, you'll, hear a, you'll hear us talk about this over and over again, but our approach is very much how can we achieve those environmental stewardship targets while ensuring that we have a strong economy, and this is doable. Number three, industry doesn't care about the environment. I, I, this, is, this, again, is another one that drives me crazy. I'm sorry, I'm going to sound so irritable by the end of this. Um, you know, you look at, if you look across, um, I, I was at the PDAC conference in Toronto on Saturday. This is the, one of the largest mining conferences in the world. Every single one of the companies that were there, there's over 30,000 people who go through the conference in three days. All of these companies have corporate um, social responsibility plans, which include environmental management, workplace safety, uh, mitigating approaches, uh, investment into R&D, and they are proud to talk about these programs. And these, these sorts of incentives do not happen around the world. They just don't. Our country has incented this behavior, and, and, and you see that reflected in industrial policy. One uh, group that I wanted to highlight, uh, the acronym is AMPI. They're the Association for Mountain Park Protection and Enjoyment. They're uh, located in Alberta, and they're a group of business uh, owners in the Rocky Mountain National Park area. Uh, this particular group um, operates in a national park, so their environmental uh, regulatory burden is quite higher than if you were uh, operating out outside of the national park. But within that context, all of these business owners have um, stewardship plans that are more stringent than what we set out in that already stringent context. And they are very proud of this. They say it as a competitive advantage because it's enha about enhancing their visitor, um, the visitors to the national, natural parks um, experience. If, the national park, if our national park system isn't kept environmentally healthy, they see it, well, people aren't going to be incentive to come and visit. So their corporate responsibility programs are all based around this principle. Um, we have industry developing best practice for environmental safety. The Canadian uh, Ener Energy Pipeline Association, uh, you know, the pipeline debate is very hot right now, but they actually uh, have standards for safety that are looked at from around the world. People come to study our pipeline safety system. Uh, and that's a fact. Um, and R&D investment, uh, Bob mentioned earlier uh, about a new uh, initiative that was just announced last week called the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, uh, whereby most of the major um, oil and gas players have decided through a very formal governance structure to pool research and development investment and pool intellectual property. 
So for those of you who are familiar with, with this terminology, you'll realize the import of that because what they're saying is we're going to invest in something by which we do not necessarily intend to take profit from. And we are going to develop a clean energy sector uh, at, for the sole purpose of ensuring that we have good practices in managing our resource. Uh, some of the technology that's coming out of this, and I, all, I encourage all of you as conservatives to look at this, for those of you who get pushed on the oil sands debate, things like uh, chemical extraction process for bitumen that would see greenhouse gas uh, emissions on an uh, overall basis be reduced to almost nothing, uh, solid, uh, solid tailings pond settling uh, technology. So right now the debate on tailings ponds uh, is that the, um, the sediment in there takes hundreds of years to settle. The flocculent that they've developed actually sees that uh, happen in, I think, instantly, what I saw. Uh, and, and, and the list goes on and on. This is one example of many different areas. Uh, I'll try and go a little quicker. Canadians don't take re direct responsibility for the environment. I, Bob talked about this. We have a network of people across the country who um, volunteer to keep our na national parks clean, uh, to uh, work in removing and man remove and manage um, uh, invasive species uh, to give easements uh, on their land to conserve uh, for future generations, um, trade associations that build these principles into their practices, um, and, and Canadians are engaged in this dialogue. So, you know, again, another myth that I, you know, I hate to see propagated on an international stage. My favorite uh, as an Albertan, but as a Canadian, that the oil sands are an um, unmitigated environmental disaster of epic proportions, Mr. Speaker. Ah! Um, uh, you know, when you look at the, uh, the reality of the oil sands, the dis total disturbed land at present is less than the size of, city of the city of Edmonton. All of that development is subject to reclamation permits. If you, I encourage all of you, my opposition colleagues have not yet done this, to go and visit Fort McMurray and see for yourself uh, the Suncor number one pond, which is completely reclaimed. Um, less than 0.1% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the oil sands. As a note, Canada only produces 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and again, the R&D story here is incredible. Uh, since 1990, the industry has reduced per barrel greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. So these are, these are facts that we need to talk about when we're looking at policy in this area. Not saying that we can't do things better, but there is a desire to do that and we're moving forward. Uh, the Canadians don't use renewable energy, don't conserve energy. I, the fact is, is that 75% of our electricity is generated from non-carbon emitting sources great hydropower sector in this country. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing how much electricity is generated from hydro uh, in our country. Uh, you know, everything from building standards, appliance standards, to um, uh, fuel, uh, f uh, fuel incentives. Our country does conserve energy. We're, we're very cognizant of that. Uh, reforming environmental review processes will re result in decreased environmental outcomes. Uh, for those of you who listened to Minister Oliver earlier today, he probably touched a little bit on, uh, as he has been in the last month, the need for regulatory reform. And this is getting skewed by the left as while we want to destroy the environment. That is patently false. I'm not sure, especially having a, a background for those of you who are in the private sector to say, how can we improve efficiencies in our business processes equals let's kill the environment. That's a little crazy to me. Um, but this is really what we're talking about is for industry who are undertaking large projects, they should be able to say, are we going to make a window to market for, for those of us that are participating in particularly capital sensitive uh, investment climates? And um, they should have predictability and scope, and that's, that's what we're saying with our regulatory reform message. Conservatives don't care about the environment. This is my favorite. That if you profess to be a conservative or have conservative values, that you automatically do not uh, care for the environment. And we know, uh, Bob talked about this at length already, that this is just not true. We see this in conservation groups. Uh, you know, we have a great hunter and fishing community that, you know, we, we see wetland restoration. And, and you look at our government's track record where we've really tried to have those concrete action steps put in place. And, and I'll, close, I'll close with this. Um, that Canadians in aggregate support the left's vision for environmental policy. You know, I, I think that the, the result of the 2008 election and the 2011 election disproves this fact. 
because uh, in 2008 we saw the um, uh, tabling of a carbon tax plan, and I know that you guys have had some discuss discussion on that, but that was rejected resoundingly by Canadians, and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, people understand uh, tax policy and also understand um, potentials to uh, competitively disadvantage our economy. And uh, we have to be cognizant of that in our policy as well. Um, so I think that w what I'm trying to say here is that we're seeing as conservatives a shift in this in Canada because people support fundamentally a balanced approach on the environment. So if we can lower the rhetoric and lower the temperature and start talking about out outcomes, stewardship, wise use of resources, both taxpayer and natural, we will win on this issue, and we are winning on this issue. So uh, just a couple of quick examples. Kyoto, um, we had, a, personally in my, my riding and then others across the country, had a lot of feedback from people saying, thank you for, for t t tackling a tough issue. And not only just pulling out, but saying this is what we're doing domestically and internationally to address this problem in a meaningful way. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, this is really a call to arms to you, a, a task. Um, anyone who is involved in the conservative movement needs to be involved in the environmental debate because it's a key issue that we get wedged on all the time. Not only that, though, it's a key um, area of economic that, that could inhibit our economic policy. So I encourage you to, as, as our government continues with this balanced approach, um, stay involved in the dialogue. Uh, look at what industry is doing. Look at what some of the um, our, our, you know, very positive action-focused NGOs are doing and support those activities and talk, talk to your colleagues about that and the importance of it. So I probably went way over time, but uh, thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. And uh, just before I start, I would like to uh, really have this opportunity to pay tribute to uh, Preston and Sandra Manning. Uh, they're the ones that got me involved in politics initially, so uh, my wife blames them for that constantly. But, uh, you know, I should have brought a slide of Preston and Ian Todd and myself in, in, um, in uh, Mumbai. And there's Pr Preston. We told him, watch what you eat, Preston. But he didn't, he didn't listen. I always carry at least 100 eat more chocolate bars with me. And uh, we told him, but he didn't listen. Ian and I uh, both ate eat more chocolate bars. But we have a picture of Preston, Mumbai in the background, holding an eat more chocolate bar. And uh, I treasure that picture. I should have brought it so that you could enjoy it as well. But I want, really want to thank Preston for putting environment as a major part of the things that he says and does. Uh, this guy's a real leader in our country, and uh, I know all of you here respect him, and uh, most Canadians do as well. So when he says environment's important, I think uh, Canadians will listen. So I thank him for that. I've been asked to emphasize action rather than talk, and some of the things that I've done to uh, make this happen, and I think I would, I would say about four things that would be what I have done throughout my involvement in environment and the things I'm doing today. One is I believe environment should be an issue that conservatives should be proud of, can talk about, and not hide their heads about. I think there's so much we can do, but what we have to do is tie environment to the economy. Tie environment to the economy. You can't have a good economy if you don't have a good environment. And it goes together, and I'll say a little bit later about my experiences in China, where now they don't have a good environment, but man, are they asking for one now. And so that proves the point, I think. There's no such word as no or can't. It's how we're going to get it done, particularly in the area of technology. Technology will provide so many of our solutions to our environmental problems. We are moving to a low carbon economy. The European Union is down the track a long way. If Mr. Obama wins the next election in the US, you better believe we're gonna move a long way down the low carbon track. The 
Asian countries are moving to low carbon economies. We can't be left behind. We need to start talking about how we're going to develop technology, how we're going to deal with the environment, because there are going to be penalties if we don't deal with the new technology and the new reality of a low carbon economy. And finally, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And I believe you can turn that into political action. A lot of places I go, they ask me to talk about climate change. I have talked about climate change for years and years and years. And, um, you know, I, I, I get around the argument largely by saying, okay, so there's volcanoes, there's sunspots, there's, there's forest fires, there's whatever. But don't you really want to deal with pollution? And everybody says, yeah, let's deal with pollution. I don't want dirty water. I don't want dirty land. I, I don't want this dirty air. Now, again, because I'm doing so much in China, obviously, they have the example right out there. You know, you get a rash if you put your hand in the water. You can't see the street lights across the corner. Uh, that's pretty bad environment. So anyway, when you talk about pollution, you now have their attention, and you really have the attention of outdoor Canadians, campers, city dwellers, whether they own a cottage somewhere, or whether they're a fisherman or a hunter or whatever, you, there's a whole group of Canadians that aren't really hooked to any political party, but they should be, and they could be, if you could appeal to them on that environmental stage. So what about action? Well, my first thing, was to, to say, okay, I'm going to put solar panels on my roof. First step, I need to find out what the regulations are in Alberta for putting solar panels on the roof. Well, okay, I had to join the Energy Producers Association and that cost me $860. They wouldn't let me go to a board meeting though with NMAX and EPCOR and TransAlta and so on because Bob and Nicole Mills we're producing energy, damn it, we have to pay, we should be able to come to the meeting. They wouldn't let me come. They said I had to do a noise impact study. They said I had to get NAV Canada approval because some airplane somewhere might be distracted from my roof. They told me that I had to get Alberta transportation uh, uh, permission to do this. So I suggested, and, and the final straw really, was you have to locate your structure 300 meters away from the closest residence. That was about it. So that was my first thing to get the law, to get the regulations changed. We managed to do that so that now they have to buy my energy, but now I can only produce one megawatt. So guess what? I'm going to double my installation so I produce two megawatts. Uh, let's go to court. Bob and Nicole Mills versus big industry, big government. It gets people's attention. And that's really important. My wife is an important part of it. I understand Bob and the log splitter. I had to uh, convince uh, my wife that I could put solar panels all over my roof. I needed a roof at 51 degrees angle facing south. She wanted a screen porch. Guess what? 50 foot screen porch fits my 28 panels and my 60 solar tubes. And uh, so uh, that's what it looks like. And uh, so, we, so we built her a screen porch. I got my solar panels. I sell every day into the grid. You probably can't see it, but in the top right-hand corner, there is a little meter there that has dollar signs on it. The grandkids run downstairs every time they come to see how much money we're making. I think they're thinking down the road or something. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, so trade-offs. There are trade-offs in environmental issues that you have to make including with your wife. <laughs> and so, but the point is, I could run daily tours of our house because so many people are interested. Now, in Alberta, I get paid what they charge me. So I have two meters, one in, one out, and it's going to take me, you know, 89 years to pay for the system, but it has come down 40%, and uh, it's getting a lot better. The panels that are now being manufactured in China are four times better than the ones that I installed that were produced in San Diego four years ago. So that's how much it's changed. They're putting a solar panel in space and they're going to beam down a microwave to drive a generator 24 hours a day. That's where it's going. 
So there's a future out there. We need to be on top of it. We need to talk about it. It excites people, but show it by action. Garbage. I have been called Garbage Bob. I have been asked to speak about garbage in probably 60 or 70 countries. And I get to talk about garbage everywhere, uh, sometimes to huge crowds, because everybody has a garbage problem. It's not enough to, you know, I could talk about uh, all kinds of things and I could oppose landfills. I gave my first anti-landfill speech in 1972 when I said landfills are, you know, going to pollute everything. They're the time bombs of the future, the liability, the emissions into the air, into the water. And people kind of looked at me like some kind of a, a strange person. Uh, first of all, though, another trade-off I had to make with my wife I said, you know, when we go on holidays, we should look at garbage facilities. <laughs> and so whether we were in Austria or whether we were in whatever country, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, everywhere we traveled, we went to garbage facilities. Now, the best one was in Denmark when I said, we're going to go to Denmark for a week. There's great shopping there. You'll really like it. The Danes picked us up at 7 in the morning, got us back at 9 at night. We visited every garbage and energy facility throughout the whole of Denmark. And I even climbed to the top of a windmill and, and scared myself to death. But uh, there was a very attractive uh, foreign affairs lady that was with me, so I couldn't chicken out because it wouldn't be very macho. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, the, the, there, there's all these sorts of things. So anyway, I convinced her, and lo and behold, we're in Barcelona. And in Barcelona, hey, can we visit Hera? Hera's a big garbage guy. Wow, the, the, one of the owners of the company came and got us, took us around and showed us his garbage facilities. They have outlawed landfills in Spain, and they're recycling old landfills. And guess what technology they were using? Canadian technology. Guess where the company was from? Ottawa. And here I am in Ottawa, I didn't even know about it. So anyway, I got, uh, went and looked at it, and this is the Plasco plant, uh, the test plant in Ottawa. And the great part about that whole thing is that now Ottawa is going to put all their garbage through that. It's just been voted by city council, and that's pretty exciting. I, I won't take time to go through the process, but uh, the process basically is put garbage in, chop it all up, recycle what you can first, then chop it all up, uh, hit it with uh, 8,000 degrees Celsius, and turn it into its molecular base, recombine it into usable materials, sell all the usable materials, and nothing goes to a landfill. Our competition is Germany, France, Sweden, and, and uh, uh, several other countries that sell incinerators. An incinerator sends 30% to the landfill. We send nothing to the landfill. So it's a really exciting technology. And uh, sometime if you want to hear more about it. But the most exciting part is those are the countries now where we're installing uh, this technology. And uh, the most exciting part, of course, is in China, where we're building a 1,000 ton plant. And uh, that will be just the beginning of what's going to happen. We have plants in, uh, nine plants going in Poland. California has chosen the technology. This is Canadian technology that, released, that takes care of their garbage problem, and it's pretty exciting. Um, thirdly, in other words, action. You wouldn't believe how many times. Next week, I'm speaking to two rotary clubs and a military group about garbage. Uh, I get tons of garbage requests because people have that problem. But you're acting, you're doing something, not just talking about or complaining about the problem. So if you want to get traction, get active, do something. The National Roundtable, set up by Brian Mulrooney, back uh, under his green plan in 1988, I, I used to, I trashed them actually in committee several times. I didn't really know what they did. But they are probably one of Canada's only complete think tanks where they provide information for, for uh, all, you know, whether it be pu the public, uh, universities, politicians. Uh, it really does some really good work, and I would urge you to take a look at what they do and uh, just see, see uh, some of the good stuff. Ac action again. We sent out information to 1,200 schools. 
just about, think about it, kids. You know, think about what's coming. The fourth thing would be the international thing, and I know we're getting a little short on time, but I do work for Globe International, a British company. I do work for the World Bank, and I, most important, do things in China. Largely in China, I go university to university and talk about climate change, talk about a low carbon economy, talk about the environment. And you know, you wouldn't believe it, but in China, and I'll just sum up by saying, this is what the message that, that stuck with me. I'm in Guilin, I'm in a hall many times bigger than this with a bunch of students. There's 35,000 teachers being trained at this particular university. And a little girl way back over there after my speech, and remember, when you give a speech in China, you have the Communist Party from the local community sitting behind you in chairs. So there's, there's 10 of them. And the little girl gets up. When I, they said, you're going to ask them for questions? Like, we don't do that. Well, I do. And they're used to me now, so they let me do that. A little girl stands up and she says, Mr. Mills, I really understand what you say, and I'm worried about my parents and my grandparents, and someday I'll have kids, and I'm worried about them and their health because of the environment that we have here. What can I do? What can little me do? I'm 21 years old. What can I do? And it was great to say to her, convince your politicians that that's something that you really care about. Well, you better believe in the debriefing after around a round table with these guys who are, I can feel them squirming, and, and to sit with them, what did you mean? And I said, well, you guys remember the Great March in 1949 when the people didn't like what they saw anymore and what they did to you, to the government? Yeah, we remember that big time. Chairman Mao taught us all that. And uh, well, guess what? What you're hearing now from these students is exactly they're unhappy. They're unhappy about the environment. So, you, so I got to say, having been asked to speak in the People's Congress and so on, I have to say that the message there now, when they did their five-year plan in March, guess what's number one on their agenda? Environment. And that's, that's their five-year plan. They do a five-year plan every five years, March to March. It's approved by People's Congress. Environment is number one. Guess what they're asking for now? How are we going to get the municipalities and the cities to move fast enough to change their technology? And I'll tell you, they're doing it. It's a 360. I've been going to China since 1979. You can't believe the changes that are going to happen in that country with technology. A low carbon economy is coming. We better be ready for it. And uh, so in conclusion, action is what's important. Keep it focused, keep it real, keep it simple. It doesn't have to be complex stuff. Prove you don't have to be a raving socialist or a cave-dwelling environmentalist in order to care about the environment because we all live out there in the environment. That's the message, sincere message, that you've got to get across. People are thrilled to find out you're a conservative environmentalist. It is shocking how many times they'll say, you were what in Parliament? Uh, you were a conservative? Were you only one? I'm really glad that there's not just one. I'm glad I left and replaced by people who really do care. That's what's so important. You don't have to be any of those other things. You can be a conservative and care about the environment. In my writing, there are three major industries. Agriculture, oil servicing, and petrochemicals. I got elected five times with huge majorities because I was doing something, even if they said, he's kind of a fanatic environmentalist, I think, but they said he's doing something. And to me, that's the message that's most important. And, uh, and so I hope that you'll take that with you and, and take it back to your areas and make environment important to, uh, to a conservative. Thanks.
Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My, uh, my wife, Deb, is, is over here. Uh, after uh, Garbage Bob's uh, comments, I feel like I should uh, offer to take you uh, out for dinner to the sewage treatment plant. Uh, sure, let's go. By the way, I, uh, I don't like to use a PowerPoint. I find that they take attention away from me. You know, almost 60 years ago, in his then uh, groundbreaking book, uh, The Conservative Mind, Russell Kirk wrote these words. The modern spectacle of vanished forests and eroded lands, wasted petroleum and ruthless mining, national debts recklessly increased until they are repudiated, and continual revision of positive law is evidence of what an age without veneration does to itself and its successors. He called it an age without veneration. Russell Kirk was the intellectual father of the modern conservative movement in North America. And even in 1953, when he wrote that book, well before the birth of the modern uh, environmental movement, he saw that society needed to once again be guided by prudence, balance, and living within our means, whether the issues were, were government spending, lawmaking, or our relationship with nature. Now, you've heard from my colleagues about various aspects of the environment. I want to talk about how conservatives can win on environmental issues. For starters, conservatives, big and small c, must take the issue seriously, because Canadians take the issue very seriously. Uh, four years ago, polling showed that the environment was the number one issue for Canadians. It's almost always one of the top three issues, along with jobs in the economy and health care. Of course, different people have different ideas about what we're talking about when we mention the word environment. And uh, these days, the mention of it would cause a lot of people to want to jump in to a discussion right away about climate change. I think we should resist that temptation and instead talk about the one approach to addressing environmental problems that everyone agrees with, conservation. To again quote Russell Kirk, nothing is more conservative than conservation. We should also note and celebrate the conservative influence on conservation. Most people in Canada's conservation movement fit the conservative profile. Hunters, fishermen, cottage owners, RV owners, bird watchers, farmers, and ranchers. According to the Center for Environmental Stewardship and Conservation, over a million Canadians belong to conservation organizations. Most of them are dedicated to hunting and fishing and outdoor pursuits like that. In the 1970s, Kirk wrote again, the prudent stewardship of the earth is essentially a conservative concern, not the domain of the statist progressive or the seething radical who is more often a despiser of mankind than a lover of nature." End quote. He was referring to that great conservative belief that we must live within our means not just in the fiscal sense, but also in the ecological sense. You know, the old joke uh, was that environmentalists are like watermelons, green on the outside and red on the inside. And that's certainly true of the seething radicals that Russell Kirk referred to. But those people are a decided minority. Ducks Unlimited Canada, an organization mostly made up of hunters, has 159,000 members, almost twice as many members as Greenpeace Canada. Then, of course, there are dozens of other hunting and fishing organizations representing hundreds of thousands of conservative-minded conservationists. When you do the math, Bob talked about doing the math, most people in Canada who are active in conservation wear camouflage on the outside, are blue on the inside, own guns, drive trucks, and watch the stock market. In other words, it's time we came out of the duck blind, the RV, the tent, or the cottage, and let it be known that conservatives are conservationists and we are proud of it. Now, of course, conservation for conservation's sake is important, but we should recognize that it's not a message that resonates with everyone. We also need to remind the public that nature and outdoor pursuits make a huge contribution to the Canadian economy in two important but very different ways. 
In 2000, a federal provincial task force produced a paper called The Importance of Nature to Canadians based on data collected from 87,000 people in the 1996 census. They determined that in that year, 20 million Canadians spent $11 billion on nature-related activities and equipment, with U.S. visitors adding another $700 million. Today, that number would probably be a lot closer to about $20 billion. Outdoor activities make a massive contribution to the economy. But nature itself also makes a huge contribution to the economy. For instance, forests and wetlands clean our air and water and sequester a million uh, millions of tons of carbon. Oceans and lakes provide a food fishery for billions of people. Bees and other insects pollinate our crops. One estimate is that every year the world is the beneficiary of these so-called ecological services to the tune of 33 trillion, with a T, dollars every year. We need to remember that nature itself creates enormous wealth. Now this idea is starting to find its way into Canadian public policy. Bob Sopuck will remember this. In the 2011 Manitoba election, flooding on the Red and Assiniboine rivers was a major issue. Every year, hundreds of millions of dollars in crops and infrastructure are destroyed by floodwaters. In the election campaign, all three party leaders agreed that it might be time to restore the wetlands that, are, that used to serve as a buffer between farmland and, of course, urban areas. Instead of spending billions of dollars on disaster relief, dikes, and diversions, it would be cheaper and more effective to pay farmers to put wetlands back in place and pay them to leave them there. This would immediately save money, of course, on disaster relief while creating jobs, cleaning the air and water, sequestering carbon, creating habitat, mitigating flood damage, and creating recreational opportunities. And you know, wetlands just don't wear out like roads and bridges. They really are the gift that keeps on giving. These, of course, are arguments designed to appeal to our reason, but we must also speak to hearts. The old saying is true. If they don't think you care, they won't care what you think. Big and small C conservative leaders need to begin to speak proactively, personally, and passionately about why conservation and the environment should be a priority. Outside of Preston Manning, I can't recall when a conservative party leader in Canada, federally or provincially, last spoke about their personal attachment and passion for the outdoors, although Bob Sopuck and is coming up on his heels. And yet over 20 million Canadians spend at least some of their time in the outdoors every year. Yes, Canada is mad about hockey, of course. We're extraordinarily and rightfully proud of our soldiers. But Canada's forests, lakes, mountains, prairies, and coastlines are also central to our identity. The curious thing is that while conservative prime ministers seldom speak out on environmental issues, they have made important contributions to protect the environment. John Diefenbaker's government helped found the Nature Conservancy of Canada 50 years ago this year. And John Lowndes, president of Nature Conservancy, is at the back of the room. Great to see you here, John. Uh, of course, uh, Brian Mulroney has been voted our greenest prime minister. Mention was already made of the round table. He also signed the acid rain agreement with President Bush that was so successful that today young people have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about acid rain. In six years, Stephen Harper's government has increased the amount of land and water under the protection of Parks Canada in six years by 50 percent. Not something you're going to read in the Toronto Star, I can guarantee you. But as good as that is, we must do more. If the controversy around the oil sands and the Northern Gateway Pipeline do nothing else, they make it clear that the status quo is not acceptable. In a speech to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, the president of Nature Conservancy, John Lowndes, and I mentioned John a moment ago, argued that for the oil and gas sector to have the social license to expand the industry, the industry must come forward with game-changing ways to help the environment. He said, why not step up to the bat, uh, this is a quote, why not step up to the bat with the goal of offsetting all production and related activity with direct conservation actions? Direct conservation actions that not only could result in protected places, but also conserved working landscapes where people can ranch, fish, hike, 
and even access mineral interests provided surface disturbance is, minim is minimized. The, con uh, the conversation around responsible energy is a conversation about the full suite of environmental, economic, and social issues, including land and nature. Land and nature are, in my view, easier to understand and communicate than other environmental issues. Land and nature are more tangible and their impacts or protection can be communicated visually." End quote. What John proposes really is the elusive balanced approach. I think Russell Kirk would approve. Ladies and gentlemen, millions of conservative-minded Canadians already believe that economic development, including farming and ranching, forestry, mining, and oil and gas exploration, can be done in a way that is harmonious with and even enhances outdoor recreation, wildlife habitat, and a healthy environment. That's the business model of the Nature Conservancy, of Ducks Unlimited, and many others. The Delta Waterfowl Hunting and Conservation Group is a proponent and partner in alternative land use strategies, and they have many projects underway across Canada, which reward landowners for preserving sensitive habitat. You know, these are all winning policy ideas, but they must be adopted on a much broader scale. They are also winning political ideas, and conservatives should be purposeful in taking them up as major planks in their political platforms and legislative agendas. We should not be running away from an issue that could help us win elections in perpetuity. It's time for conservatives to take back this ground by proactively talking about conservation, quantifying nature's benefits, talking about our record as conservationists, promoting uh, cooperation over conflict, and game-changing solutions that encourage both economic growth and enhanced environmental protection. But big attitudinal shifts don't come easily. They require consistent research, education, and advocacy. And that, in turn, requires an infrastructure. We need a national conservative organization that brings together the best conservation thinking and practices and then distills them into policy ideas that governments can adopt. We need to harness the time, money, and efforts of conservative-minded people who believe that game-changing conservation should be our foundational environmental policy. Our goal would be to harness a network of like-minded conservation and outdoor recreation organizations, farmers and ranchers, those who work in forestry, oil and gas and mining companies, and the general public to advance the conservation agenda across Canada and to influence federal and provincial governments. In Britain, their organization that does exactly that is the Countryside Alliance and uh, Bob, is, Bob Sopuk is a big salesman for them. Make sure you ask him about that organization. And I should say, by the way, I want to acknowledge Bob Sopuk for first proposing this idea of bringing people together in one big group to be an advocate for conservation. And Bob and I would like to hear from people who are interested in forming that kind of group. And we would like to begin that process by gathering people together at a conference at some point in the near future to discuss some, some next steps. In conclusion, I want to quote one more time from Russell Kirk. He said, every right is married to a duty. Every freedom owes a corresponding responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for conservatives to step up and assume our responsibilities as Canada's conservation leaders in thought, word, and deed. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a few minutes left for a couple questions, but uh, while people make their way to the microphone, should they have any questions? Uh, I, I have a couple questions for you. First of all, out of curiosity, uh, who here by show of hands makes their living off the land? Who, who's farmer, logger? Few. Who, what about recreation? Who spends some time in the natural environment? Hunting, fishing, camping, hiking? Lots, lots. Good. Who among you would be comfortable calling yourself a conservationist or 
whatever we decide to call it, but I call it uh, some, some. Who, who thinks that this ought to be a priority for conservatives, big and small c? A lot. And, and who wants to come to the conference? Uh, good, all right, good, yes. Good, make sure they get your names. All right. I, I, we'll get a smaller, all right, yes. <laughs> Very good. So uh, we've got some handheld mics here. Uh, so we've got uh, Leah, you've got a question for us. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know that Preston has been talking a lot about this issue for many years. I'm just thrilled to see a panel about it. My name is Leah Costello, and I host uh, a number of events, a lot of them to do with public policy. And recently in Vancouver, I hosted Brian Crowley, who's the um, executive director of the McDonald Laurier Institute. And he introduced me to a phrase which I can't remember exactly, but it had something to do with the perishable nature of opportunities. And I thought that was a really uh, significant phrase in the context of the development of our natural resources. We have some opportunities, for example, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, I'm from British Columbia, which seems to me, in general, like a pretty good idea. What we're struggling with right now is that we are having a lot of conflict over the development of this um, uh, the expansion of the pipeline and therefore the development and expansion of our oil sands. And I worry that the conversation that we need to have and the streamlining of the way that we talk about resource development and environmental uh, conservation is going to happen too slowly for some of these major opportunities um, for us to be able to take advantage of them. So there's a there's an unfortunate context that we have. Um, you know, we have a fantastic federal conservative government. The risk is that we're seen as railroading things through, but at the same time, the perishable nature of this opportunity is something that's pretty critical. So I was wondering if you can talk about the development of a better way of, um, de of you know, marriaging, or sorry, the marriage of economics and environment but how can we do it quickly enough to not lose advantage of this? All right, good. You want to go ahead, Michelle? A number. Oh, great. They're on. Um, just a couple things very briefly. Uh, first of all, on, 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 I think what you're talking about is regulatory reform. So, you know, Minister Oliver, again, to restate, has been very clear on that need. Uh, so has Minister Kent, and uh, this is certainly a priority for our government. But again, focusing on streamlining process while still achieving that economic uh, or that environmental outcome. So, so we, we, we take that quite seriously in government. So we are going to take uh, steps to do that. Uh, with regard to, um, to timeliness, uh, I think that it also behooves industry. Industry needs to come out and also it can't just be government uh, taking the bully pulpit on this. Industry really needs to be quite vocal in how that balance can be achieved. So I think you know, that's probably the next step as well is, is advocating industry and um, you know, think tanks like Monty, Monty just described uh, to present that alternative view. Uh, just quickly on the conservation side of thing, one thing that Bob nor I mentioned uh, was that the Environment Committee is following up on a promise that was made in both of our campaign uh, platforms, but especially in 2011, to develop a national conservation plan. And uh, for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing, um, it's developing on a government side exactly what Monty was talking about. So while we're looking at the regulatory reform piece, we're also saying, as a government, this can be our legacy. So uh, you know, we're certainly, we certainly feel that fire from the government side. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Bob. Well, all I would add uh, is that you've got to put all of the information on the table. For too long, industry has taken things for granted. I think government has taken things for granted, and then you get resistance. So I think you, you point out, you know, here are the advantages, here are the disadvantages, here's how we can fix these things, and then you go ahead with projects like the Northern Gateway. I think you can make a really good argument for a safe transmission system, and, but industry has to do that. They have to show how safe it is and how they're going to take precautions when they cross rivers, when they are in difficult terrain and so on. So it's a, a lot of it's information, communication, and making people uh, feel part of it. I use that uh, Denmark example of windmills. You know, the way they solve the problem there, and there's no opposition at all, is they make everyone an owner. And when you get a check every month, you, uh, you uh, don't oppose those windmills. Well, just briefly, if I can, um you know, it strikes me that now that we're at this point, it, we've missed the best opportunity uh, to con convince people that we can build a uh, pipeline uh, and uh, do it in a way that's, uh, 
you know, disturbs the environment in the most minimal way possible. Uh, but uh, again, if I can mention John Lowndes, uh, John mentioned in his speech uh, to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers the idea of environmental offsets. And if you're going to claim an acre of land, this is quite common already when it comes to things like wetlands, uh, that you set aside three acres somewhere else that preserves habitat uh, but where, you know, there's not going to be mining or oil and gas activity. And so really, in a case like that, what you're shooting for is uh, a net environmental benefit instead of no net loss. But, you know, John's the guy to make this argument uh, much better than I, than I can. But I, I think that's where you need to start way ahead of these projects and make it clear when a project occurs, the environment will actually come out ahead. Uh, sir. Hi, Chuck Stroll from the West Coast, and uh, uh, good discussion today, and, and it's not the first time uh, because uh, I think I first read it, as Bob mentioned, or somebody mentioned, maybe uh, I first read it in uh, when Preston Manning wrote it in the Globe and Mail. So, like, you know, you guys, you're, you're, you're catching up six or eight years from, you know, you're, you're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's, my point, I think, I think you're onto a good thing. I, I, I don't know if the Manning uh, networking system can help on this because I think uh, one of the guys with some cred on this is, uh, is Preston himself. But uh, I think where you folks are talking about the, uh, the need to gather significant numbers of people to start thinking about how to dovetail uh, sound conservative principles into a sound political agenda is, uh, is long overdue. The only thing I would point out is that uh, I do think it has to be really cast quite broadly. They, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at your invitation list, you know, I still hear stories, for example, of the blue-collar trade unions are still not welcome to meet with conservatives. I mean, your best ally, I'm telling you, we talk about social license. You want to get, those are, our, those are our people. Those are, that's the welders and the plumbers and the laborers and the, the guys that have worked in the field and know how to do it and have seen it done wrong. And they're on your side if they feel welcome in the tent. But you've got to invite them, folks. You can't say they're all this, you know, they're all uh, green and red or whatever. They, you know, I mean, they, they're just part of the answer. You have to have a First Nation component. I mean, you, you, to think that you're going to get this kind of consensus without understanding at least a First Nation component, uh, it seems to me in, in Canada, where First Nation rights are enshrined in the Constitution, is not likely. And finally, you're, you're going to have to, I think, find a way to answer that question of, uh, that I hear from some of our farm guys, as an example, from the logging guys from my background, is that when you, if, if you don't do it well, you end up driving uh, with the offset issues and so on. The farmers get annoyed because they say, well, the, the conservancy came in, bid up the land all around me and, and artificially change the price of farmland. Like you hear that sometimes too. So you have to, you're gonna have to deal with that. And uh, there's some examples around the world that can do it. But, but my main point is just to encourage you as you advance this, is to think of the bigger, there's a bigger group that will come in and talk with us if it's expressed in terms of a future for conservatism and conservation together. They'll be there, but you don't, please don't forget them. Because right now, uh, what I hear is that they're knocking on the doors and no one's there. So, good idea. Just make sure it's a broad, big tent. Very good. Any, any quick comments? Okay, why don't we take the... Uh, uh, we're out of time here, so two quick questions, and then we'll give them one last uh, chance to respond, okay? Okay, well, speaking of a big tent, uh, I, I represent the Canadian Wildlife Federation. With uh, due respect to the Nature Conservancy, we're the largest wildlife conservation organization in Canada. With the million conservation conservatives you're talking about, we have 300,000 of them. So uh, we're interested in what you're talking about, Monty, and uh, you know, uh, would love to be in on that. Um, I think that, uh, while well, you may have the hearts and minds of the hunter and fisher and outdoorsman element of that, there is a large element, at least in our constituent base, that's um, what might be more of these urban greens that they were talking about earlier this morning. And I don't know that you've got them. And to go to the, the, uh, the uh, thing that the mom, hum, hum, Hondi said about if, uh, if they don't think you care, they don't care what you think. And I wonder if uh, that's where the conservative mo mo movement is with some of those people who otherwise match your demographics quite well. And we'd love to talk to you about that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'd just like to hear about those people, whether you think that you've got them or whether that's where you're trying to move. So urban greens, and if you don't mind, just because we'll take the second question and then give everybody a chance to respond here. Uh, sure. 
Mishka Lysak from the University of Calgary. Um, I want to highlight, Bob, what you mentioned today and, and very much applauded in terms of your description, not only your personal experience in terms of solar panels, but your experience of what, seeing China moving in this direction, a whole thing around renewable energy. So the question I have, and maybe it's more directed to Robert and to Michelle, is um, what are the possibilities of using a country like Germany and the fact that they generated every year for over $4 billion in industry, that generated uh, 300,000 jobs, that the renewable industry has Canadian companies in it that uh, come from Kitchener and Waterloo and so on. And, um, and that part of the economy has been the most resilient to the economic downturn. So the question I have is what are the options, what are the opportunities, strategic openings, where this could be something that the government would very much push as part of a truly diversified economic development strategy for Canada? So uh, two good questions there to finish off, and if you've got any final comments, it's a good Mishka, were you, were you talking about green energy yeah. in Germany? Was that what you were referring to, renewable energy? Yeah, yeah. 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 Renewable energy, I've got something here, uh, it's entitled uh, the Financial Post about a, three weeks ago called Germany's Solar Experiment Collapses and it's my unfortunate tendency to do the math again and again they're really rethinking solar energy in Ger Germany. Now it's a cl cloudy country, it doesn't have the, resort the solar resources that other countries might have but the subsidies right now are at a 130 billion dollar level. And, the, and Germany's Minister of Economics and Technology has called, quotes, the, spir the spiraling solar subsidies a threat to the economy. And this is from the Financial Post. And again, I, I think in all this stuff, you simply have to do the math. Keep emotion out, out, out of it, it's simply the math. To deal with your question about the urban greens, I, I think a better term is sort of suburban soccer moms and dads. They've been sold a bill of goods by the other side. What I like to do if I'm in a, an urban setting giving a talk, talk to folks, I, I say, before we start this talk on the environment, can you point something out in this room that was either not grown or, or dug out of the ground? And obviously you can't because everything, and you can't do it in this room here. We have the metal, we have uh, plastics from the oil, we probably have some wood in the room. You know, some of us are munching on potato chips, you know. so. The, the first thing to do with those suburban soccer moms and dads is connect them with our natural resource industries. That's what you do. And again, so, and that's what I go back to my point, playing on our football field. That, so you say, what you enjoy as the good life starts out in our natural resource industries. So you have an interest in seeing those industries going. And, and th so that's how I, I would, would, would do it. We, our messaging cannot be sort of a, a mirror image of what the other side uses. It simply can't. Um, in terms of the issue of, uh, the lady brought up the issue, Lee, I think you brought up the issue of the gateway pipeline. One thing we need to do is separate environmental process from environmental outcomes. They're often two different things. Quite fr frankly, you could build the Northern Gateway Pipeline tomorrow. We know how to build pipelines. I, as, as a fisheries bi biologist, I, was a, I did some of the earliest work in the Mackenzie Val Valley. Uh, you know, I work with pipeline companies. We know how to build pipelines, stream crossings, to do it in an environmentally sound way. The environmental process as, as it exists now is really damaging our country. And I look at the Mackenzie Valley pipeline as the bad poster child for environment process. We did the studies back in the 70s, I was a young biologist there, I went up and down the Mackenzie Valley sampling fish, wildlife, my dream job, and did it all. All the environmental work was done. The Berger Commission and Pierre Trudeau went along with it, it nixed the pipeline. And back when the pipeline was brought back again in the 90s, all that environmental work was done again, it was all repeated that nothing had changed in the Mackenzie Valley. All those years of work were, were redone. A panel was reconstituted. The panel sat. Basically, for 34 years, the Mackenzie Valley pipeline was discussed. And I think the window on the Mackenzie Valley pipeline is now s s firmly slammed shut because of shale gas. And as a result, 
there's 20 Aboriginal communities in the Mackenzie Valley that will remain impoverished in perpetuity when we could have built that pipeline in an environmentally sound way 30 years ago. That's why what we're talking about right now is really, really important for our country. We'll give uh, closing comments, recognizing we're already out of time. So, yeah. uh, just really quickly on the, com uh, the comment about uh, clean technology being an opportunity for economic diversification, I could not agree more. Um, you know, when, when you're looking at in, in incenting innovation, there's a lot of dialogue about uh, the cluster effect or creating clusters. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, if you can leverage off of, an, uh, you know, a secondary industry or an in a primary industry that's already well-funded, operating well, and then grow off of that, um, that is, that's the way to drive innovation, or one way. And, you know, certainly in Alberta, um, Alberta especially, you, you see the emergence of a brand new sector in our economy. And uh, this is happening, it's, a, it's driven by industry, but it's also driven by, um, you know, partially by government regulation, by incentives, et cetera. The, the climate is there to do it. And I, I just wanted to briefly say, I could not agree with you more. And, you know, within our policy, we need to ensure that we're enhancing that clean, uh, sustainable technology development. Canada, great organization that's uh, working in that area. And uh, we should be looking at policy to, to, promote, to promote, promote that sector and ensure that it thrives. I could not agree with you more. Um, on the urban, uh, urban green issue, you know, uh, certainly that's a big issue in my riding personally. Uh, you know, one of the concepts that we talk about when we, when we talk about a national conservation strategy is how to connect Canadians with the environment. Because I think, I think right now um, there's, you know, the average urbanite, um, the way that, that, that environmentalism is, is painted in a, in a retail way is it's this sort of nebulous, amorphous concept that someone else should take care of or that industry should take care of, or that it's government's responsibility, when really it boils down to consumer appetites. So uh, if you're not going to change your behavior personally, um, then we can't incent policy development. We can't incent change in behavior at an industrial level because there has to be, it has to be a consumer-driven approach too. So obviously government has a role in incenting that behavior, but I think part of that ties into what my colleagues were talking about from promoting conservation as a key principle in conservative policy with regard to the environment. So if we can connect Canadians with the environment, get them to take personal ownership on that connection between their personal environment um, and, and their behaviors, that's, that's a key part of the, um, the issue that we can't ignore in policy. And it's a key issue in connecting with that group of people. And I think that's where the dialogue has to start. Because you're right, we have a gap there and we have to reach out to those people. Well, um, I, would, I would again echo uh, things like STTC, for instance, to promote innovation and get companies started. We really need that in this country. But internationally, what we really need from government is to have them not provide money, but just provide support by saying, this is a Canadian technology, uh, we acknowledge it as a Canadian technology, it's a Canadian company, we believe in this company uh, and, and help them out there. It is very sad to be in a negotiating session when, in, in the case of garbage, we compete with incinerators, and to have a Mr. Sarkozy there with Veolia from, from France, to have uh, the Minister of Environment from Germany there with Siemens, to have a minister from Sweden, and to not have the janitor from our from our embassy in Beijing. Uh, we need to have that kind of support. Not money, support. We're Canadians, and in, in, we have to understand the cultures of different countries. Government to government relations are extremely important in many countries. And the fact that the government isn't there, just at a boy, really does hurt uh, our, uh, our jobs, because there's jobs back here, and we need to improve that. Well, just very briefly, uh, with respect to appealing to uh, uh, urban Canadians on this, I don't think uh, the Conservative Party does a very good job of reaching um, urban Canadians on environmental issues, and certainly on uh, conservation, but that's partly because we never talk about it. And we certainly don't talk about it in a personal way. 
And uh, to me, it's frustrating because I know, I know my former colleagues, former cabinet colleagues, colleagues in the House, and uh, so many of them love to go to the lake on the weekends, they hike, they bird watch, they, they spend time in the, in the outdoors in various ways, and uh, uh, it's this peculiar thing uh, with conservatives where they, I think they'll feel like they've been co-opted by the other side if they sort of talk in a personal way about these things, and I think that's unfortunate um, because there are a lot of people who really do want to know that you uh, care before they'll really care about what you what you think. So, you know, that's uh, those are wise words I think for us to heed. And I'll just say one final thing: uh, Happy uh, 50th anniversary of the Canadian Canadian Wildlife Federation, because I know uh, you were also born 50 years ago uh, this year, and we do appreciate uh, your great efforts. I used to get your magazine when I was a kid uh, a long time ago, or one of the magazines my dad got for me. I appreciate it. So, thanks for being here. Appreciate it.